two workers in each facility participated. My objectives in this study, first of all, I wanted to compare ammonia concentrations and emissions, uh, ammonia concentrations and exposure between the three facilities. In order to do that, I have to measure ammonia concentrations. Uh, number two, I wanted to recommend measures to minimize and lower workers' exposure to ammonia based on the first objective results. Uh, the third one, to apportion workers in hill concentrations among their microenvironments, I wanted to see which microenvironment caused that high ammonia exposure. So I used what's called a repeated measures, an over statistical analysis in my study. And the hypotheses tested for personal and environmental exposures. I wanted to know, are, I was questioning myself, are ammonia concentrations the same for the three facilities for inhaled concentrations and environmental concentrations? Are ammonia concentrations dependent on days? Did they depend on days, weather conditions, all that? Number three, I wanted to test the difference in mean concentrations and wanted to see if it depends on days or not. And specifically for personal exposures, I wanted to test if ammonia concentration is the same for the two workers that work at the same facility. I had to use what's called, or I wanted to use, uh, TUK test. TUK test tests or uh, shows what day of the, of the sampling period had higher exposure, ammonia exposure, than the other, and what day of the whole sampling period had lower exposure than the others or equal. Uh, brief description of the facilities. This is the Swine Center. The Swine Center is composed of uh, a, a center, a confined center, and a barn area outside. It's going to be behind this building. Uh, the Swine Center has office room, which is like a classroom. Then it starts, they have two storage rooms for tools. They have four rooms, starting by the uh, farrowing room, then nursery room, uh, gestation and growing or finishing, then out. Uh, outside, once uh, someone gets done with those uh, with those rooms, outside there is the barn, and usually it holds up to 20, 24 pigs at the time. Uh, takes up to five, I guess, five months to get to have the finishing pig for uh, commercial uses. Uh, for poultry facility, poultry facility they have four chicken houses. Each chicken house holds up to 30,000 birds. It's the average is between I would say uh, 25 and 30,000. Birds, bird flock, and the flock takes up to 49 days. It depends hugely. Sometimes they leave the chickens for 55 days, something, but the average is 49 days. And they have a workshop behind those uh, broiler houses where workers spend most of their time in. The equine facility is also composed uh, of swine, of, uh, sorry, of the barn area and the stalls area where they have horses here for justification purposes if the horses are in, in the barn area. Um, usually they hold up to 727 horses. They usually have them ages from 3 to 15 years old. And it's important to note in this study that this facility specifically was all open to the atmosphere. So for uh, the first exposure sampling I used what's called personal monitoring badge. This is the badge. Workers, every one of the workers at the morning used to open one of these bags and put it aside and open the badge like that. This badge has what's called a white disc inside. This white disc is a sulfuric acid silica gel that air diffuses inside as is and then measures, it's a passive sampler that measures ammonia gas and then I uh, once the workers get done with their shift, I take it, analyze it in my lab, and know how much ammonia concentration does it have. Uh, this is the, the data logger to measure was attached to the sampler to know, uh, to measure the humidity, relative humidity and temperature. And the time-weighted average uh, equation that I use to know the eight-hour time-weighted average is this, which and T is the duration of exposure, and C is the concentration of exposure in that duration. Uh, this is one of the workers at the equine facility, and she was happy when I took it. Say, <laughs> uh, as I said, six workers participated to in each uh, each facility. 
I asked the workers to put the badge and the data logger within, within the briefing zone because I really want to know how much ammonia is inhaled. And the exposure was up to eight hours. Usually, most of the exposures were four hours because most of the workers are students and students are only allowed to work four hours a day. So it was kind of limited. And the, from Monday to Friday, five business days a week for two weeks. <clears throat> when I get done, or when I go to the farm, pick up all the samplers, I uh, used to go to the lab and analyze all the samplers using some chemistry analysis. And this took me three to four months, the whole summer period, just to know how to do this, because I'm not a chemist. But uh, I could finally, referring to so many resources in the OSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, I could know how to generate all these. Calibration curve was created before analysis is done, just for accuracy purposes. It was created from uh, <coughs> ammonia, nitrogen ammonia, 100% standard solution. So when I know the concentration for each one of those samplers, I used to put this, these vials in a spectrophotometer that uses light to measure the absorbance and transparency, <coughs> and I know the concentration uh, based on the uh, calibration curve. And it's based on the uh, pure M uh, Lambert law, absorbance equals to the negative logarithm of transmittance of negative logarithm of the final intensity of the light and over the initial intensity of the light. Then the lab analysis, this is the spectrophotometer where I put the, each vial of these vials. And the, usually the darker the color, the higher the concentration. So um, for example, those green, like they were really, really high, like at this point. <coughs> Um, the white disc that I just showed you inside this badge is, was submerged, each one of them was submerged, all of them at the same time in a 20 milliliter deionized water free of ammonia and I tested that. The pH was, was adjusted with sodium hydroxide between 5 and 6.5 and was measured using some um, uh, uh, sensors uh, for, for pH measurements, electrodes, I'm sorry. And then I uh, add a little bit of this sampler, or this sample, to these vials, and some of them are HR, and uh, it, like high rate and low rate, because if the high rate uh, didn't show me anything, I would use the low rate, and it, sh it should show me something in the spectrophotometer. Then, once I get all the data that I wanted, <coughs> all the data from all workers, over <coughs> 10 sampling days, I want to know the, if any of those personal exposure measurements exceeded the threshold limits or the regulatory healthy standard, which is from Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, which is 50 parts per million. So if any of my values exceeded this, then that is a problem. Uh, some I had to use referring to NIOSH, Occupational Exposure Sampling Strategy Manual, that was written <coughs> in 1977. I use what's called, you know, some statistics, upper confidence limit and lower confidence limit, and this is the mean. So at 20, I wanted to uh, measure the, the values at, 20, at 95 confidence limit. And there is something called partial, partial period limit because <coughs> most of my samplers were exposed to ammonia gas uh, for less than eight hours, so I have to use this. Uh, uh, abbreviation or partial period limit. Then continue with the compliance testing. There are three tests that are applicable in this study. And then I had to calculate something called the standardized concentration to make a separation from the PAL. So for example, if I had for a worker in that day 8.25 parts per million, per million, then I would divide that on 50 parts per million, which give me this number. Then I calculate for LCL based referring to the manual, and there is something called CVT coefficient of variation, uh, which is 0.05 from OSHA, and use, uh, UCL is the upper limit as well. Then continue with compliance testing. I have numbers, both of them less than one, and then the partial period limit is four hours over eight hours, 0.5. <coughs> And this three in this case is only applicable 
and I found out that none of the workers was exposed to levels that exceeded the, the health standard, and that's a good thing. So all the facilities are compliant with the health standard in the field. 50 million. And then for, uh, for the personal exposure results, they vary from 0.05, and I know that's very low, but there is a reason for that, and to eight, up to 8.25 per day, or per eight hours. Uh, poultry workers were exposed to 127 higher than equine and 91% more uh, concentrations or more exposure than swine workers. And day three was significantly higher in all between all other days. Day one, four, and ten were significantly lower, and the other days were inconclusive. I found out that uh, the workers at the swine, at the poultry and equine facilities, they they ex they were exposed to different concentrations and they varied significantly. But for workers at the swine facility, uh, kind of similar um, concentrations or similar uh, exposure for both of the workers. Also, the inhaled meat concentrations very significantly, and P was uh, 0.01. And I found out that the days, which including the weather conditions, had an effect on the measurements. Sorry. And that also the difference in mean concentrations was significant and dependent on days. This is an example of the activity logs. This is why I gave workers activity logs to know where they spent their time during their work shift. For example, this is an example for a poultry worker. And as an average, over the 10 sampling days, they, he, they or he or she uh, spent the time, spent mo most of his time uh, inside the houses, like 31%. I would say not most of, the, of his time, but 31% of his time spent inside the houses. Workshop <coughs> outside, they used to spend 38% medicine room, which is like a, an office and composter 14%. So as an average, 72, 75, 81 minutes per day were spent by the poultry, equine, and swine workers, respectively, uh, where ammonia was high and generated. So now this is the second type of sampling, environmental exposure sampling. I use this kind of samplers. Maybe it's not really clear, but it's a calorimetric tube that measures ammonia. It's also a passive sampler that measures ammonia by diffusing inside this tube, and the color changes during the exposure uh, duration based on the concentration. At the poultry facility, I had five samplers, two samplers at the eight line, one at the soils, one at the barn, the barn area and four samplers each in, uh, in the fermi nursery growing, but there was no sampler inside gestation because the room was empty, no pigs inside, so there was uh, no, you know, doesn't mean anything to, to have a sampler inside that room. And sampling was done every day as for the <coughs> personal exposure measurements. These are the locations, one inside each room, I would say in the three rooms that I tested in, and the barn area, uh, stalls area, barn area, the equine, and one sampler inside each one of the chicken houses, and one at the uh, workshop. These are just pictures. I was installing the this sampler inside one of the chicken houses. Uh, this is a worker at the swine facility. Uh, this is the stalls area of the equine, and this is the barn area. And it was really tough to put this sampler inside <coughs> those, like inside these fences because, you know, the horses will play with them and then it doesn't matter. <laughs> so the, the workers, all of them, just suggested to have it in this area, which is safe. For environmental exposure results, I had really variant results and significantly different, especially at the poultry house. Poultry houses reported very, very high concentrations. Equine and swine. Uh, where. Equine swine like had lower exposures than poultry facility. So um, the concentrations varied significantly during the whole sampling phase, and also <coughs> found out that the days played a role and affected the concentrations, and the difference between concentrations also depended on days. My conclusions in this study: none of the workers 
exposed to higher concentrations than the threshold limits. And only chicken houses recorded high concentrations. And sometimes during the eight hour period, uh, some of the samplers recorded like up to 120 parts per million. Uh, there was a relationship between personal and environmental results or exposures, but the R square value, which is a value that represents the relationship between the two exposures, was weak in the study based on some because of some limitations. And recommendations: poultry workers should wear half mask respirators when they work inside any chicken house, so they would lower their exposure. And increased ventilation is recommended. So, so many studies I've read that say and suggest if, there, if the ventilation rate increases, it's going to end up with having lower exposure. And actually, this is the most uh, famous feed for chickens in East Texas, and it has 20% uh, protein. But if they use 10% protein or 15% protein in the feed, it's going to reduce. Based on some studies that they've done before, they suggested that it's going to reduce ammonia concentrations by up to 50%. And of course, if they maintain the moisture levels, not only in poultry houses, but also in all animal facilities, below 70 degrees inside, for example, a broiler, it would prevent it would prevent litter to gain which results in lower exposure. So I measured the humidity in the poultry houses and it was reported most of the days was like 78, 75, something. So at 70, it should not cause the litter to gain. Uh, limitations of this study, location. Location, I only had 11 samplers. Not because uh, they're not accurate or something, but it was actually expensive, kind of expensive. Uh, we had limited budget in this study. Each U cost $8 and each badge $15. So for 11 locations, for 10 days, for six workers, that's kind of expensive. Also time, time sampling was done only in one season in two weeks. Probably other studies could do it for different seasons. Uh, participants, lim limited number of participants. As I said, most of the participants, or all of them are students that work uh, four hours a day. If uh, someone really wanna know how much uh, uh, like a worker during from, from 8 to 5 then he has to go to a farm that officially have uh, has workers that work full time and that, that would be the probably better. Activity logs could be more specific and type of sampling. In this study the sampling was integrated but measured the concentrations from more, uh, the first, let me say, during the whole shift. Uh, but not exactly during the whole shift to measure the time weighted average, but not exactly to know, not exactly knowing the exact concentration at the exact specific time. So maybe, probably, other studies would like to <coughs> conduct a study that has probably integrated with continuous or only continuous to, to know at this time exactly worker was exposed to this amount of concentration. Acknowledgements at the end, I would like to thank Dr. Perez so much for the help and support. Without her, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you. And uh, thanks for my thesis committee, Dr. Larry, Dr. Cobble, Dr. Sato, uh, Professors John Mahaffey, Stacey Appleton, Joel Prey for allowing me and uh, conduct my study in their facilities, <coughs> these people who are in charge of the animal facilities. And uh, my family, thank you so much, and friends. And uh, many thanks for the students who helped me and supported me and participated in this study. Also for our fac uh, forestry building and faculty and National Resource Conservation Service and University of Texas Health Science Center for their help and support and others who I may not know as well. And then uh, Francis and I will say thank you. Questions for my I, I realize you have a lot of limitations in the study. Could you hypothesize about the, in the poultry facility since they had the highest ammonia levels? If the birds had been older versus younger, would the worker exposure have changed? Definitely. Uh, the, the birds' age was three weeks in the first week, and the second week they were in the fourth week of age. 
they usually stay fifth week, sixth week, and then they remove them. So I would say uh, that, that's, that's a kind of uh, limitation probably as well. Uh, if we measure the data from the first week of age and the last week of age, I would say the uh, exposures or concentrations should be higher. Any other questions? You said you saw a uh, correlation between the ammonia concentration and the, the days, or what was that? Uh, did you think that was dependent on the weather conditions? Exactly. So you, you said something about higher humidity uh, inside the, the poultry houses would have result in a higher concentration of ammonia. Yes. So you, did you see some correlation between weather conditions, yes. higher humidity? So here, the day three. Yes, day three. So day three. This is the benefit of having the data loggers of, uh, that measured the relative humidity and temperature. I went back and I saw this. And I was wondering, as anyone may wonder, I went back to the data loggers, to all the data that I had, and I found out that the highest humidity and temperature was on day three because it was rainy, foggy, thunderstorms. Uh, especially in the, in the poultry house, they, they didn't want the fans to, to blow the air out because they wanted to keep the temperature at, at, at the, uh, like an exact level, which is, was like 70 something, 78. Uh, so the humidity got higher, and which results in more exposure because microbial processes will be, you know, will increase. Any other questions? That was my question. You know why? Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Amar. <laughs>